Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. In honor of Black History Month here in America, I want to start today by reading a poem uh, from Margaret Walker. Poet and novelist Margaret Walker was born on July 7, 1915 in Birmingham, Alabama to the Reverend Sigmund C. Walker and Marion Dozier Walker. The family moved to New Orleans when Walker was a young child. A Methodist minister who had been born near Buff Bay, Jamaica, Walker's father was a scholar who bequeathed to his daughter his love of literature. At age 11, Walker began reading the poetry of Langston Hughes. Later, as a university student in 1932, Walker heard Langston Hughes read his poetry in a lecture recital at New Orleans University, where her parents then taught. She met Hughes and he encouraged her to continue writing poetry. Her first poem was published in 1934. Walker's first collection of poetry, For My People, in 1942, won the Yale Series of Younger Poets Award. Walker was the first black woman to ever receive the prestigious award. Walker's many honors and awards included six honorary degrees, fellowships from the Rosenwalk Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Fulbright Commission, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. She was awarded the Living Legacy Award by the Carter Administration, the Lifetime Achievement Award of the, of the College Language Association, and the Lifetime Achievement Award for Excellence in the Arts. On October 17, 1998, Margaret Walker was inducted into the African American Literary Hall of Fame. So this is a poem by Margaret Walker called For My People. For my people everywhere, singing their slave songs repeatedly, their dirges and their ditties and their blues and jubilees, praying their prayers nightly to an unknown God, bending their knees humbly to an unseen power. For my people, lending their strength to the years, to the gone years and the now years and the maybe years, Washing, ironing, cooking, scrubbing, sewing, mending, hoeing, plowing, digging, planting, pruning, patching, dragging along, never gaining, never reaping, never knowing, and never understanding. For my playmates in the clay and dust and sand of Alabama backyards, playing baptizing and preaching and doctor and jail and soldier and school and mama and cooking and playhouse and concert and store and hair and Miss Chumby and company. For the cramped, bewildered years, we went to school to learn, to know the reasons why and the answers to and the people who and the places where and the days when in memory of the bitter hours when we discovered we were black and poor and small and different and nobody cared and nobody wondered and nobody understood. For the boys and girls who grew in spite of these things to be man and woman, to laugh and dance and sing and play and drink their wine and religion and success, to marry their playmates and bear children and then die of consumption and anemia and lynching. 
for my people thronging 47th Street and Lenox Avenue in New York and Rampart Street in New Orleans. Lost, disinherited, dispossessed, and happy people filling the cabarets and taverns and other people's pockets and needing bread and shoes and milk and land and money and something, something all our own. For my people walking blindly, spreading joy, losing time, being lazy, sleeping when hungry, shouting when burdened, drinking when hopeless, tied and shackled and tangled among ourselves by the unseen creatures who tower over us omnisciently and laugh. For my people blundering and groping and floundering in the dark of churches and schools and clubs and societies, associations and councils and committees and conventions, distressed and disturbed and deceived and devoured by money-hungry glory-craving leeches, preyed on by facile force of state and fad and novelty, by false prophet and holy believer. For my people standing, staring, trying to fashion a better way from confusion, from hypocrisy and misunderstanding, trying to fashion a world that will hold all the people, all the faces, all the Adams and Eves and their countless generations. Let a new earth rise. Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and a strength of final clenching be the pulsing in our spirits and our blood. Let the martial songs be written. Let the dirges disappear. Let a race of men now rise and take control. One, two, three. Who is welcome at the table of the Lord? All are welcome here. You are welcome.
you show us God's grace. we collaborate with each other to be the church we're called to be and to serve how we serve. And our contributing financially is one of the most important of those ways. If you want to help fund and sustain what we get to do together, go to crosspoint.org slash contribute to see the many simple ways that you can do so. You can even text crosspoint NC to 77977 to receive a link to get started now. Thank you for your partnership in the work we do together. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. 
but I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust in you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. Countless times in recent years, and already three times this year, I'll have a conversation with somebody, and they'll say something like this. They'll say that they appreciate the wisdom that can be found in the Christian tradition, the wisdom in the Bible, uh, lots, lots of stuff, but that they don't believe a lot of it, or they'll say they don't, they're not sure what they believe. Uh, all they know is they don't believe enough of it to be considered part. They're, they're not part of the religion. And very often, somewhere in there, in there they'll say, uh, and they always drop their voice down here, and they'll say, I'm an agnostic. And when they say that, um, I gasp. Uh, I, I cover my mouth in, in shock and disgust, and I demand that they flee from my presence. And I just wanted you to know that so you could be proud of me as a pastor, like how seriously I take the faith. What I actually end up saying to them uh, almost every time uh, is what I'm going to say to you uh, just in longer form today. I, I want to offer today words of encouragement. Uh, this will be instructive, but I, I, I offer it as relief, as, a, as an affirmation for those who need that. And I'm not trying to make anybody out to be a victim here, but I do think that maybe you or somebody close to you, uh, it's, it's almost bullying. It's, it's almost a, a bullying that happens, uh, whether intended or not, uh, by a religious rigidity, uh, a person or a group. And that's why I feel like this has to be addressed a, you know, a few times a year. Christianity has, for very many of us, it's been gatekept. I don't think that's a word, but it's a word now. It's been gatekept from us. It's become something other than Jesus following, but more like this constant examination of the accuracy of our beliefs. Um, there's, there's so many people in the world that they're in our churches, in our families, in our lives, and they're constantly publishing their demands on us that we have to believe certain things about the Bible in a very specific way, or we're not in, or, or we're, the, we're the downfall of society. Maybe you can relate to that. There's Jesus, but then all but drowning out Jesus, there are countless voices that label the in-groups and the out-groups, diagnosing the world as needing to believe how they believe. Uh, if, if you just believed the Bible better, if you, if you just read it and came to my conclusions, people in our lives, people not in our lives, on TV, people we elect into office claiming to have God figured out because they, they open their Bibles and they say, yes, Yes to whatever I'm, I'm reading, uh, regardless of any other fact or, or, or feeling or, or discovery or conclusion, I am in. We are us because we say yes, no matter what we're reading. And you're out because you read it and said, well, but, or anything like that. And so what I hope to do is to help us see that in the long history of faith, there are dimensions and approaches to thinking, to theology that have been left out of most of the modern conversation, um, which have made tons of us feel like we're, we're a problem to fix or cast out. And so you know, many, many of us have just left. So I'm gonna be talking about two things today. Uh, they're, real, they're very much related, 
but I, I'm going to be talking about the Bible a little bit. And it's not going to be exhaustive, and I'm, it's, it's just really kind of one theme I'm talking about today. Um, so very briefly about the Bible, but then I'm going to be talking about God. And really what I'm going to be doing is talking about talking about God. And in the bargain, you're going to learn some new cool words, philosophy terms, all right? So in advance, you're welcome. Um, Pew Research, Gallup polls, lots of different surveys that come out every year, and they keep showing us the same thing. I'm sure you've heard about this, but belief in the Bible, uh, as it's tradition has been traditionally believed, it's changing. I'm fairly confident that that describes you. Um, you are very highly unlikely to regard the Bible the same way that your grandparents did, even though the way that your grandparents did was probably very similar to the way their grandparents did. It's, it's fewer and fewer people every year who consider the Bible, for instance, to be literally true, 100% true, 100% without errors, 100% uh, uh, without any outdated perspectives about the world or people. And the number drops more and more every survey. At the same time, the surveys are showing more and more adults saying that uh, I don't really identify with any denomination or any particular religious label. M more people say that than ever in recorded history. Three in 10 adults as of 2021, they describe themselves in surveys as religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, which just means no religion in particular. 29% of the population of those surveyed. 63% still self-identify with one of the very many Christian traditions, however loosely. They're still saying, well, well, this one is still my thing. But that's just over two to one, Christian to mm, nothing in particular. In 2007, it was five to one. That's how fast it's changing. This trend gets equated to by a lot of the most theologically conservative Christians, and rather anxiously so. It gets equated to society becoming more godless, a society who no longer believes the Bible's words as they were written. Therefore, it's becoming lost and spiritually dead, anti-faith, anti-God, depraved, all of that. that. That one equals the other. And so there's no space left for the fact that, and again, I bet I'm describing you, that the change represented in these surveys, it's, it's not saying that people are going from belief to no belief. It's been from the Christianity of our earlier years to something more or other. And, and, and it's something less black and white, uh, something that has more questions than uh, necessary answers, something more interested in the welfare of all people, everybody, inside or outside the us context, something more tolerant of nuance and uncertainty and difference and mystery and I don't know, while at the same time less tolerant of exclusive rigidity, doctrine that gets used as, the, as a filter for friends and that sort of thing, something, something more willing to grow in kindness and peace and less willing to prioritize the preservation of our own tradition. It's it's clear that we're not giving up belief, really. We're, we're starting to believe more than somebody else told us we were allowed to. But for many of us, it's, it, it feels like our experience, our honest journey, no matter how real and good it has been, it, it's, it's like it has to be disguised or even lied about. Or the real Christians are going to tell us that we're, there's something wrong with us, that we're the problem, that we're spiritually broken or deficient somehow. In fact, some people see invalidating other people's faith as a way of proving the legitimacy of their own. And some people are, they're famous for it. They do it for us in their books and their sermons and their podcasts. I, I don't like criticizing people by name if they're not in the room, but I'll do it <laughs> for some people. John MacArthur is one of those people. He's one of several exceptions I'm, I'm comfortable making. He's a pastor. He's a radio host. He's written a gazillion books. He even has a study Bible that has his name right on the cover, John MacArthur. I mean, that's a, that's a bold move. Um, he's shaped Christianity and American policy since the 70s. And so I sort of think he's always in the room, in America at least. So I bring him up because he's one of the loudest voices about how Christians are allowed to believe, what they're allowed to think, about what's illegitimate in your faith, how not agreeing with his read on the Bible is to be opposed to God. And he's not the only one, but he's certainly a, a flagship for the, for the mentality. So he said this in a book recently. Authentic Christianity, so 
right from the start here. Let's, let's, let's be clear. He's not talking about the other kind. Authentic Christianity has always held that Scripture is absolute, objective truth. The Bible is God's truth regardless of whether a person believes, understands, or likes it. It is a permanent and universal truth and therefore is the same for everyone. Scripture doesn't pass away, go out of date, or drift out of relevance. No one has the right to redact it, question its pertinence, or set, us, set it aside in favor of something more culturally sensitive or socially acceptable. It is flawless and perpetually true, and thus the source of all praise and honor given to the Lord. Now, he absolutely does not believe this. I've never met him. I know that sounds bold on my part, but hear me. He doesn't believe this because no text which requires translation, interpretation, and teaching can be absolute. We have to get involved. And even if it could be absolute, he doesn't believe that. And there's a ton of reasons why. I mean, I'll just be petty about it. For example, St. Paul in his writings in the New Testament, he instructed followers without caveat to greet one another with a kiss. And I guarantee John MacArthur doesn't get smoochy at his church. And, and for whatever reason he doesn't, his reasoning comes from outside the text. Great, we all do that. But I, I, I simply am confronting the people who say they don't do that and you, that you can't. We all do this. We all contextualize the text. But his rhetoric is very powerful and it's, it's influential, isn't it? It says very forcefully that your experiences with God are not valid unless it fits into the contours of somebody else's framing. The genuineness of your faith requires you to squash your questions, squash your unapproved wonder. You can't legitimately build on what's been written. You have to stop with what's written. You can't entertain other ideas. You can't adopt other traditions' wisdom. You can't aspire to take the story to new, maybe better places. Your faith experience is not valid unless it passes somebody else's test. And they'll, no one would cop to that because they would say, no, it's, it's the Bible. And they forget it's their interpretation of the Bible. I watched somebody describe an absolutely incredible mystical experience once. Uh, it was a spiritual experience that they had. They could barely put words to it. They're describing it. It was, uh, it was profound. While they're talking about it, I, I've, I've got chills. I, uh, it, it was a remarkable story, and I believe them. And the person they were talking to was a pretty influential Bible teacher. And their response to hearing the story was, unfortunately, the Bible doesn't teach that that's something we could uh, or should expect to happen. And so, therefore, it must have been some sort of delusion, a hallucination, maybe drugs. It was really disappointing. So, you know, gee whiz, why are fewer and fewer people identifying with the faith or, or the declarations of the Bible as absolute and prohibitive of any disagreement? Because in large part, they, you, are trying to live and believe with integrity. It's because they, you, are discovering that the Spirit is moving as she always has in all places in all peoples, not just in the Bible, and certainly not just through you know, the teaching of one narrow band of Bible teachers' opinions. And that would only be threatening if the goal is to create a group that has control, that has control and is superior to all other groups. And maybe that statement sounds a little harsh. Maybe it sounds like I'm vilifying some really great men and women who would never say that that's what they wanted. And I don't think in uh, very, I think very few people consciously want that. But I, I want to say, our egos, and I have one, our egos have a near impossible time valuing something unless it's more valuable than something else. Our egos can't easily understand how something could be worth anything unless it's outranking or outperforming something else. And so what value could a sacred text and its God have unless it was absolute and better than everything else? and restricted to, to, uh, to those of us who engage it correctly, uh, it, unless it, it could be useful for making an elite team. What other way could we find value in it? But this is one of the reasons 
why it's not working anymore, and why Christianity of this variety is on its way out and has been for decades. Because the demand that the Bible and its ways of speaking be believed without any questions, or you're out, that it be accepted whether we like it or not, or you're out, well, that hasn't held up. And we know it hasn't. We know it can't hold that kind of weight. Let me demonstrate this fact. Genesis says that the moon is a light. We have since learned, since that was written, it is not a light. It's reflecting light. Leviticus says grasshoppers and locusts have four legs. They do not. Genesis and 2 Kings and, and Job and Malachi all say that there's up in the sky, there is a solid metal dome uh, with little lattice windows. I, uh, I'm told that's what the Hebrew literally translates to, little lattice window, windows in it to let water pass through one side to the other. Now, we know that's not how it works up there. Revelation talks about there will be one third of the stars that will eventually fall to the earth. We've been up there. We know that's not how stars or up there works at all now. We can't pretend to not know these things. We can't pretend to, to, to believe that those things are true. And I know you can Google it and find explanations for these, but the explanations are, one, often not at all accurate, and two, aren't part of the text. The explanations become necessary because we acquired new knowledge, which is, a, uh, is another way of saying that the text isn't absolute. But here's the point. We know these kinds of biblical declarations aren't accurate. And there are so many of them. I could go on. People didn't used to know that they weren't accurate, but now we do. But the reason some feel the need to pretend we don't know this is because of the idea that to see the Bible as, as less than absolute, as less than flawless, and not able to be questioned, for a lot of us, it feels the same as doubting God, the God the authors in the Bible speak of. Well, that's not right. That's not the case. We honor and respect the text, not by declaring it's perfect and flawless, but by using it as a sacred tool. It's useful. That's how it speaks of itself when it, when it does. But God's existence isn't contingent on the Bible never falling short of perfection. I mean, surely none of us would say an imperfect saxophone cannot play a song correctly in the right hands. Our faith is aimed, however sloppily, at that which the Bible points to, but beyond it. Why, why would we insist that people believe the map has to be on par with the terrain when we can see with our own eyes in many ways it's not? Now, understand the resistance over this isn't about the moon and it's not about how many legs are on a grasshopper. It's fear. Fear about the clarity that we're afraid that we're, we'll lose about God in the process of being honest. The, the objection I get is it's always something like this. Well, if, if, if it's not true as written here, on what grounds can we know that anything else in the Bible is true? Like God, like God himself is legitimate. And, and I get that. I know this can feel like a big holy sweater. And if I pull this thread here about the moon or whatever, isn't the whole sweater going to eventually unravel? Because isn't it all connected? But this presupposes that you have no, no experience with the divine outside of this text. That's a weird thing to suggest for a people whose slogan is often, it's, a relig it's not a religion, it's a relationship. If your relationship with God fades to the, to the degree that the Bible can't stand up under the strain of honest analysis, then Aren't we revealing to ourselves that our relationship is wrongly centered? This, this is why I said at the top that I would be talking a, a little bit about the Bible, but also about God, because there's a fear that what's really at stake isn't whether Leviticus knows what an insect is, but our ability to actually know God. And it's this all or nothing mentality, this invalidating gatekeeping way so prevalent in conservative e evangelicalism. It's driven so many people to say, the love and wisdom of Christ still draws me in, but I guess I'm out because I can't pretend to have other perspectives. I, I can't pretend to have come to other conclusions about a lot of what's in here. And if that's not good enough to be called authentic, well, then I'm out, I guess. So with the rest of my time, uh, I, I want to attempt to show you that you're not out. 
if that's meaningful to you. I'm hopeful to just crack a door back open if that's what you want. Uh, and that do uh, this door leads into something far less anxious and narrow. There are very many ways to do, to do this, to make this point, but I'm going to do it in a way that's really important at Crosspoint. Um, it, it's it's a, a, a way of thinking about theology. and In fact, it's, a, it's a, an entire other side of theology that most of us have never been taught. Even though we, we have participated in it, we haven't realized what it is, we haven't been taught this. Easily the most respected and influential theologian and philosopher of the early Middle Ages was John the Scot. If you don't know anything about John the Scot, look him up. Uh, very devout Christian, uh, a teacher, a philosopher, a very serious thinker who, among countless achievements, one was that he was in the rare position to have learned biblical Greek, knew how to parse it and speak it and teach it. So in his years of study and meditation and teaching, here's one of the things he, he, he concluded. We don't know what God is. Even God cannot say what God is because God isn't anything. Literally, God isn't because God transcends being. Another way to render what he said is literally God doesn't exist because God transcends existence. So he's out, right? You can't say that. <laughs> but he has a Bible. He speaks its language. He teaches it. He meditates on it. He's a pretty dang good thinker. And out of the depths of his faith, he realizes, wait a minute, God isn't knowable in the way that other things are knowable. God doesn't exist the way things exist according to our, our senses. And there shouldn't be a pressure on us to pretend otherwise. Misunderstanding is the best that we can do with something that transcends being. And the result of his thinking and teaching is, is sort of like God being kept out of the box that we call doctrine. Well, before he said this, there was a, he, he was uh, in a long stream of thinkers by the time he got to that. In the fourth century, the bishop of the, the Eastern Church, he said this, concepts, by concepts means beliefs, so like doctrinal uh, pronouncements or statements, concepts create idols. Only wonder comprehends anything. People kill one another over idols, over concepts. Wonder makes us fall to our knees. I mean, this bishop is really close, relatively speaking, to the earliest church, the early pursuit of Christ and his way in the real world. And he determined that our beliefs about God are nothing more than the means by which we separate from others with different beliefs. Wonder is the true comprehension, the true knowing. Embraced mystery and 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 unknowing, that, that's faith. Genuine faith isn't based on absolutes or unquestioning submission uh, to descriptions and concepts. It's, it's an, a kind of ignorance, a longing ignorance, a sacred, I don't know, but I'd love to. The 13th century theologian and philosopher Thomas Aquinas, I'm assuming a lot of you have heard of Aquinas, shaped so much modern thought, taught the Bible, uh, very robust, genuine faith in Christ. He said, we can't say what God is, only what God is not. You might be thinking, well, hang on, Tommy, because the Bible clearly says what God is. What do you mean we can't say? But he saw the limits of language, the limits of concepts, the limits of our minds, and said awe is where it's at. He remained in awe. So here's what these men that I have quoted and countless others that I could quote, here's what they're doing. And here's where I'm going to try to make the turn to show you how there's faith apart from the loud gatekeeping voice of conservative evangelicalism. First, the Bible makes tons and tons of declarations about what and who God is. And connected to that, Bible teachers for millennia have made these same declarations. Things like in the Bible, God is a consuming fire, God is jealous, God is a warrior, God is a sun and a shield, God is righteous, God is good. These are all quotes from the Bible and they're familiar. There, there are dozens of statements like this in the Bible, and they're considered uh, part of the faith. They're, they're, they're orthodoxy. The theological term for these sorts of statements, that these are cataphatic theology. 
Cataphatic comes from a Greek word that means affirming or affirmation. When you say what something is, you're pronouncing it in the positive. You're making a cataphatic statement. You're affirming it. You're agreeing with it. So church websites are full of these. Creeds are made with these. The Bible writers are making cataphatic or positive assertions, and the implication is we would agree with that as believers. But then we have the Thomas Aquinas's and the John the Scots and countless others that invite us to come at this from the other side. It's a minority voice in the Bible, but it's the majority voice of faith and wonder that you probably haven't learned. This other side is called apophatic theology. And apophatic, the word apophatic, comes from a Greek word that means to negate, like a negative statement. And they're in the Bible too, like I said, but to a lesser extent. There's verses that say things like, God is not a man. No one has seen or can see God, despite there being stories about people seeing God. See, these are negating negative statements. They come at knowing based on what is not known or what is not knowable. They're almost corrective to the cataphatic way, and they are traditionally even applied to the cataphatic Bible verses. So you could come to this historically, you'd come to the Bible and say, well, God is not actually a shield or a son. God is not actually jealous. God is not actually good. Our definitions of good as people are too warped to apply that to God. So throughout history, the negating dimension has been a way of telling the affirming dimension, let's not pretend that we know what we're talking about here. And you do it in conversation, and you would even apply the discipline humbly and wisely to the scripture. In the fourth century, St. Augustine said, if you understand God, what you are understanding is not God. Mystery is the baseline, not comprehension. That's why faith is the baseline, not this test-ready, accurate answers, uh, the, this ability to get your head around the flawless test questions. It, it doesn't work like that. Faith is the baseline. Now, the voice within us that resists this, that's the same voice that resists everything else that takes away our sense of certainty, our sense of control. That's fear. That's not evil. It's fear. But this isn't where the Jesus story is going. That's what, that's what all this research and, and, and these surveys are showing us. This is not where the Jesus story is headed. You know that. No matter how many defensive John MacArthur books there are to the contrary, contrary you, you know that this is the case. The Jesuit theologian Karl Rayner said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or won't exist. And I think he's right. A mystic is a member of a sacred community of kindness in, in contemplation and awareness who gets really comfortable with the alarmingly nearby limits of what you can actually know. It's, it's the embrace of a sacred ignorance, this unknowing. Importantly, the apophatic way isn't an invitation to become contrarian. It's, it's, it's not to constantly contradict everything that other people say about God. That's not apophatic, that's annoying. <laughs> But it's an invitation to hold in mind that there's true, uh, the, the, the true knowledge is wonder, is a, is a way of, of not ever thinking that you know, and ignorance rather than clarity about the divine. That's, that's fundamental. That by definition, you're understanding an agnostic Christian, agnostic, A means it negates, uh, gnostic means knowledge, a don't know Christian, an agnostic Christian. That's the only kind there is, and that's okay. That's good. But this is going to be met with resistance, and it's going to be met with resistance for at least a couple reasons. One, apophatic disciplines, such that we try to employ at Crosspoint. Lots of churches are starting to realize we've got to kind of reclaim this ancient tradition. But apophatic disciplines aren't chiefly ones that you can control or build with. Uh, that's a big reason why churches and much of mainstream Christianity that doesn't teach it or acknowledge it. And many pastors and authors will talk about it uh, and write about it as a problem. Um, because how do you have control or co any sort of cohesion if uh, your movement at its center is the embrace of unknown? How do, how do you control that? I mean, it's, it's not going to be super popular for this kind of faith framework anytime soon. 
Um, I'll eat a lectern for every church website you can show me who has a statement about God Almighty, what their belief statements are about God. And, and when you click on it, it just says, we don't know. We can't know. I mean, you're just not going to see that. You're going to have more luck selling apophatic sandwiches where the ingredients are, um, well, not rocks. It's just not uh, anything you can control. It's, it's not orderly to have people of faith trained to discover ultimate reality by always looking past the concepts, always looking past the, the convenient handles that make you feel like you've got a grip on it, to, to, for them to say, no, we don't have a firm grip on it, and trying instead to remain open to mystery, uh, the mystery behind all that, that draws us beyond those things. Creeds are way easier for co cohesion. Now, a second reason the uh, apophatic way is going to be met with resistance, uh, despite its long tradition, is I, I think it leads away from certainty and clair clarity into something that feels like abstraction. And with abstraction, the, the rigid, defined concepts start to fall away, and people start seeing that, you know what, other faiths, they have similar values, they have similar wisdom, and wisdom figures underneath all of their rigidity. Like, and as, as that becomes an abstraction and ours become an abstraction, we've got a lot in common. Well, this, this undermines the exclusivity claims that organized religion enjoys. It's far easier to truly befriend one another through humbly shared mystery than through debating our assertions. And so that's a reason that will be resisted a little bit. The, the more we realize uh, that nothing is exactly as we're saying, as it, when we're talking about God, um, things start to get sort of fuzzy and we have no choice but to, to get along and trade notes. So we begin to detach ourselves from others' insistences about the Bible because we can't, we can't pretend like we're, we're not noticing the things that, that, that aren't holding up under the weight that we've put on it. We can see it doesn't work the way that they insisted. And that's okay. This has been known for generations. And we begin to trust that the Spirit is at work in any community, in our community, seeking to live out love and grace and kindness and justice and awareness. So as those things happen, though, what, what comes next? Well, we may no longer fit with many people's gatekeeping Christianity. Fewer and fewer uh, pe people fit every day. But that doesn't mean you're not behind Jesus. That doesn't mean you're not right there on the path with anybody else. Right there behind Jesus, the, the one who demystifies the eternal mystery by putting flesh on the unknowable, but does so not to answer questions, to give us certainty and clarity, but to show, uh, show us the non-mystery part that we can actually participate in is love. That's the non-mystery part. That's the part that we can actually get right. So you're in as measured by your love, by your openness to life and to carrying the Spirit of Christ into your own context, best you understand how. Right now, that you're in as you do that today, but not because of the pronouncements of religion that you affirm, that the, the cataphatic affirmations of things that may or may not uh, be even testable. That's, that's not how that works. It's your love. It's your participation in sacred community that makes you in. Now understand, somebody could say, well, but you don't believe X, so you're not a Christian. And I want you to know that if you argue with them, you're almost definitely going to lose. On the terms of agreeing with the plain cataphatic statements in the Bible, most of us lose. And at the hands of somebody hoping to win, if that's their goal, you're just going to walk away feeling terrible about that. I want you to know that. And I want you to know it's okay if you're not somebody else's definition of a Christian. I'm sure you know that, but I just want you to hear me say it because I, I work at a church. That's okay. In fact, it's okay to not be a Christian. If the fact of Jesus never using the term Christian and never telling people to become Christians is any indication, it's okay if you're not a Christian. Christianity is not the point. Christianity is not the goal. The goal for Jesus is for us to become fully alive human beings, the human beings God made us to be in the community that we're in, ever growing in kindness, awareness, and love. The goal is to accept the incomprehensible mystery of God and God's grace and God's creation that exists apart from and generally 
in spite of our religion and instead employ without mystery kindness and love and justice for our neighbor and for strangers and aliens, for our enemies and friends and for ourselves alike. Embrace the mystery, the I don't knowness of God, and then demystify our love. That's the goal. Who cares what somebody else names that? That's the goal. And so that's what we're going to do. That's who we'll be. That's what we're about. No matter what your conclusions are about the rest of it, you're as welcome as anyone else to come along. So, my dear siblings of every description and conclusion, when others look at us, if they care to form an opinion, may they say that our faith is humble and open, more full with awe and inspired unknowing than any pronouncements. And may they also see clearly that our love is no mystery at all, that we treat one another in ways that, however incomprehensible God is, reminds them of the plain and simple love of Christ. Amen. If you would like to know more or get connected to Crosspoint, go to crosspoint.org. If you're in need of care or assistance, go to crosspoint.org care. And welcome home 